Good morning, Yellow Jackets. Welcome to this year's last episode of Around the Dub. I'm Carrington Thomas. Coming up on today's show, why is church attendance among young people on the decline? We'll take a look at how we take care of our elderly. But first, gun violence is an ongoing issue across America and here in our streets of Montgomery. City leaders along with concerned citizens are looking for answers to this growing problem. Around the Dub reporter Idris Knowlton sat down with District 6 City Councilman Aranda Mitchell to talk about possible solutions to this issue. All right, how you doing today, Mr. Mitchell? I'm good, sir. Okay, I just wanted to sit down with you and talk to you a little bit about um, gun violence and, you know, things like that. So, I guess I could start off by saying, do you think NPS is doing everything they can do to, you know, protect people and issue the right laws for gun violence? So I, I think everybody can do more um, mm -hmm. when it comes to Montgomery Public School System and also the city of Montgomery. Um, I work in both aspects, so I do work for Montgomery Public School System and I'm a city council person, so I see both sides of the coin. Um, what exactly got you to, like, into politics or got you in a position that you were in? Like, um, did you start off saying, I want to do this in the future? No, I, you know, my, my mom was an educator and my dad worked at the post office, so uh, politics was, mm -hmm. was nowhere in my future. Mm -hmm. um, end up running into some, some rough patches in my life, and I saw that once you get in trouble, a lot of people like to throw you away. So I wanted to make sure that I represented those individuals that made mistakes um, so they can have a voice, because generally most times when we make those mistakes, people say we, we won and done. All right. Speaking on that, like, how big of it, not influence, but how big of a part do you think um, a person's community or background can play into their future? Um, it can play both parts. You can take the, the bad out of the good and you can take the good out of the bad. I came from, my dad was in the house, my mom was in the house. Um, both of them have graduated from Alabama State and I still mm. made some bad choices. Um, I still went down the wrong road due to they, they laid my pass out for me. I, my college was paid for, um, my car, so they still did everything and I still made bad choices. And I've seen some of my friends that came from um, not, not so pleasant backgrounds mm. that thrive. So it just depends on the individual. What are some things like uh, you're doing or you want to see implemented into the school systems or just anything that we can do to prevent gun violence down here? Um, the biggest thing is that we got to start speaking up. Like I said, I do due process hearings and I think mm. probably within a year and a half, we have, I have did maybe five uh, gun possessions. Um, if it's not gun possession, it's, it's bullets. So that's telling me that guns are so easily available for our, our teenagers today. That's, that's true. What, what role do you think the parents play in, you know, their kids having access to guns and you know, being overly protective of, like, what, what do you think parents can do to do their part to make sure that, you know, this doesn't happen, like? So, only thing you can do is talk to your children. Um, they, they're gonna make those decisions because, like I said, I've seen some situations um, that parents didn't know what their child was doing once they are out of their presence. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with me, when I was in my parents' presence, I was going to church, I was singing in the choir, but then when I got around my friends, everything everything changed from drugs to to guns. So, you know, first of all, we got to make sure that we looking at our kids surrounding and who they're with. Um, sometimes, you know, we always want to blame, you know, a lot of time I go in the hearings, well, my child was just with the wrong group. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your child is the wrong group that they, you know, themselves. Right. So we just got to look at it, our, our, our child case by case. So what are some things you think we can do to prevent gun violence? Um, first thing is, like I said, education. Mm -hmm. We gotta let uh, young folks know the consequences of, of, of gun violence, uh, what that gun violence lead to. A lot of people think that, hey, I can shoot you and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But you're looking now that the governor has just started doing private prisons. So private prisons mean it's money involved. So they're gonna make sure that they fill up those prisons and I have to make sure that they don't fill up them. So right. I'm doing everything that I possibly can because what I'm starting to see now, when it comes to, especially by black males, that they get in trouble, most of them are, are dropping out of school. Right. Most of them are reading below grade level. Most of them, are, their math scores are below grade level. So mo more than likely when a child is two grades behind, their likely chances are, are dropping out of grade. Um, and so that's what we implemented in my district. Um, 
the state, you got to realize what the state of Alabama is doing. They made a, uh, they just passed the Alabama literacy law. That means all third graders that's not reading on the third grade level will be retained. Um, so what we did this year, I created a Saturday school to address those issues about those second graders to make sure that they're on grade level. What are you doing to uh, stop the pipeline? So what I'm doing, I, I have um, asked the city and the county to uh, put together. So we have came up with $1.5 million that I'm doing a re-entry program. Hmm. Um, that means there's a juvenile get in trouble, get sent over to Pace, get sent over to Mount Meigs. They go into this program and it helps them get back into the community for his education, for his job. So we have to do things that will lure them away from what they see on TV, what they see in their community. So we give them another avenue that they need to look at. So now with you, now you being a young person, yes, sir. as a city official, what do you want to see me put in place that will kind of stop the gun violence here in the city of Montgomery? What can I do? Honestly speaking, uh, I really don't know. I feel like it starts with access to guns. Like, um, I'm not sure what the exact age requirement is for Alabama, but it definitely does need to either be raised or the access to guns needs to be limited because I just feel like it's just too much of an easy access. And the way that my generation is now, it's kind of like shoot first, ask questions later. And I feel like, especially with like us males in my generation, like we just, I'm not saying we, but it's kind of like a, I don't know, the mindset is just different. I, I really don't see anybody like talking problems out or, you know, handling it with, in a different manner. It's just like, you wrong me, then, you know, I'm gonna go get my gun and do this or whatever. So I feel like either the age requirement needs to be raised or anything else to prevent easy access to guns. And I definitely do agree with the uh, the education portion of it because most of the people that, um, you know, get caught up with these charges, with these guns and stuff like that, they've either dropped out of school or they're, they've been held back a couple times, they're at pace, like, so I definitely think education does play a huge part in it. And we're seeing all over the world that we're seeing more teenagers being arrested. I think in LaGrange, Georgia, there was just a 13-year-old arrested for murder. Um, just maybe a month ago, we had two 15- and 16-year-olds arrested for murder. And in Dadeville, we had a 16- and 17-year-old. So why is it so comfortable and so people are so easy to pull triggers on other individuals that look exactly like us? Honestly speaking, like I said, I think it's the mindset. And I don't want to say it's the mindset of just specifically my generation, but the mindset now is way different than what it was um, a couple of years ago, like as I'm hearing from older people and then just seeing it now. It's more of a like, I don't know. I, I don't, I honestly don't know, but I know that the violence is getting crazy right now, mostly because of like just the access to guns. Like I, people aren't really fighting anymore or handling their problems and talking it out and stuff like that. And then you got social media. So it's like, it's a lot of different avenues that people can get in trouble with. And then I feel like with our generation, the mindset is kind of like, all right, you wrong me, I'm wrong you back. Instead of just being a bigger person, walking away and, you know, just de-escalating the situation. It's always like, shoot first, ask question later. So what do you think schools can do? Like what? Uh, maybe exercises or policies or anything that they can do to prevent school shootings or you know anything like that. It's, it's really only thing you do like a tornado drill, fire drill, only thing you do is prepare your students mm. and just pray to God that it, it does not happen. Because right. um, we have seen situations at churches, we have seen situations at banks with mass shootings, right. even at one of our local bowling alleys. Um, your man named Lil Jeff got killed at Bama Lanes. Um, so we are seeing these massive shootings across the world. So um, being able to prevent it, unless we, we do away with guns, and mm. you know we're not going to do that because we're in the South. In the South, we believe in our Bibles and our guns. Right. So I, I don't see that, that happening. So the only thing we can do is uh, in intervention on it. All right. Well, thank you for talking to me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> According to the Young Americas Foundation, Nearly 30% of high school and college age students have never attended church services. After the pandemic, church attendance reached an all-time low. We talked to ministers and young people about why church attendance among youth is on the decline. I don't think this generation is shying away from the church in particular. I think what this generation has is a lot of questions 
And I think what they've done is they've unfortunately lost trust in a lot of different things. I think actually right now our generation, because I'm, I'm 25, so I ain't that much older than you. You know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Z. Yeah. Um, I think our generation is looking more than ever and asking the question, what is truth? And they're looking for it and they're trying to find it. And they're finding it in many different ways, many different answers. So I think what they're doing is they're shying more away from what people would call, quote unquote, organizational religion. Do you attend church? Sometimes. Why only sometimes? Well, um, most of the time the message they're giving is pretty repetitive or it doesn't like fulfill me. Like I don't really get anything from it. So I just choose not to go and have church at home. So what do you think's missing? Like what can churches do to attract more young people to the church? Um, I feel like church can be more progressive sometimes. They don't want to share certain messages talking about stuff like STDs and like relationships and stuff because they feel like um, we shouldn't be learning it. Um, and then they just turn to the same message over and over again about like social media and stuff that we've already talked about. So it kind of turns youth away. And then also um, – Youth doesn't want to come to church because there's not people like them at the church. So I don't really want to go anywhere that night, you know, not following the crowd. But sometimes I want there to be more people so we can be like a real conversation, you know. I've had the opportunity to discuss, you know, that question with a lot of pastors. Um, and but I think the most uh, profound answers I've gotten is when I talk to the young people themselves to see uh, why there has been such a disconnect. And the overwhelming consensus has been is that young people don't feel a connection to the church. Uh, I think they may feel a connection to God as they are growing in their little faith, but they don't feel a connection to the church. They don't quite understand that if you're going to have a connection to God, you have to have a connection to his church because he uses his church as his residence, as a place where his spirit dwells. I think a lot of churches do it wrong, and um, that's because there's people involved in church. And unfortunately, God does use us, and that's good for us, but sometimes on the other side of that, it's bad for people because people make mistakes, people fall short. So I think that there are definitely people that are judgmental that are in the church, but I think you find that everywhere. Do you attend church? Yes, I do. Why do you think that a lot of young people our age don't attend church? I think a lot of people, um, especially young people, feel forced upon it by their parents. But I think a lot of the youth groups are trying to improve and make it to where, like, like the church I go to, a lot of the youth group, their parents don't go to the church, but they do, which I think is cool. But part of that makes it tough with tra uh, transportation just because like they can't get to church that easily but I think making friends with the people like people that go to church inviting people and giving them rides and stuff that helps a lot because then they have transportation they know people there already and they can make friends and have a good time and learn about God yeah well I think I think the way that we can attract a younger audience in the church is by creating that family feel I think what no one has right now is much realness. There's, there's a lot of fake out there. There's, if, if you throw an Instagram post and you get 100 likes, I think that you, when you scroll through it, you think 50 of them actually like you. I think 50 of them don't know who you are, or maybe it's a different breakout. So what I think people are looking for more than ever is real, authentic, personal. We gotta talk to them. We gotta give them an avenue again, like I stated, that they can express themselves. Um, our, our worship service needs to be more um, contemporary. Uh, again, I came up on the old hymns, uh, I, and uh, there's a particular song that, that we often use to line out, and it was called A Charge to Keep, I Have, and A God to Glorify. But the way that song started for years, instead of them saying a charge, I thought they were saying, hey, Charles. What can churches do better to attract more young people to the church? Uh, again, I, I just think it's the the youth groups. Like some some churches have really good youth groups and then some barely have any people. And I think some of that is just like what they talk about and how much fun they, like there's a fun to learning ratio. And 
you got to balance that to where people still learn about God, but they also like enjoy going. And a lot of times the church has done a poor job, I believe, in giving them a platform to express their faith. Um, a lot of times as young people were coming up, even in my time, uh, we began to push the envelope a little bit in churches and some churches received it and some churches didn't. I think the church reaches out, it's more welcoming, it is more loving, it is more caring, but also I think it goes back to that first answer to the question is that it becomes more about a relationship with Jesus, yeah. not religion, not the right prayers, not the right words, not wearing the cool clothes or doing the right thing, but it's all about simply, hey, Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants to know you. Volunteering and senior citizens go hand in hand when it comes to Meals on Wheels, a program sponsored by the Montgomery Area Council on Aging, which feeds more than 400 homebound senior citizens. We went on a ride along with volunteer Sylvia Thompson to see how this program works. Meals on Wheels. Okay, Miss Duncan, all right. How are you? I'm all right. How about you? All right. Mean to you. Well, it means a lot of need I can eat. And, and you can <laughs> stay at your own and, home and, and have your own food, right? I can stay at home and it have it brought to me. Mm -hmm. And enjoy. That's right. And I appreciate it. Okay. All righty. Well, that was nice. I've been doing this uh, for, I, I remember distinctly, I can't say exact year, but it was early 2000s. I say right around 2001, somewhere in there, because I'm putting it uh, about the time I was going to the VA to work. You know, as I, I, was, I would work and I would do it every first and third. Then with the sorority, which, we, which I'll to pick up that on Monday with the AK uh, route, started doing that one after I retired. Uh, I, I, I do ring, but I tell them not to rush because I don't want anybody falling trying to get to the door fast. But uh, sometimes I'm making sure that they hear. Hear me. Okay. Hello. Well, Bill, will they hear prop as prescribed? They, they, they all nice so far that I met. Every, they've been bringing them here for over a year for me. And one thing, when we have our signs on our cars, that let other other neighbors know that we are in the neighborhood. And uh, a lot of times. We have a designated person next door that might get that meal if they had to go to the doctor or whatever. And uh, they usually work real well when they tell us about a neighbor that does that. But they, they keep, they keep out, uh, eyes out. Yeah. I actually had one client that uh, was bedridden. And this has been through the years, bedridden clients. And I was able to get a key from under a flower pot, unlock the door, go in, give the meal, come back, lock the door and put the key on the flower pot. That's what the family did. So that person could get the meal. But uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm just grateful that I'm able to get out and do this. And people appreciate it. They really appreciate it. Meals on wheels. It's a great help and deal and very thankful. I am very thankful for the help that, you know, the people that provide this service. Okay. Now, are the meals good? Very good. The only thing, they have turnip greens, and I don't <laughs> eat turnip greens. <laughs> I love turnip. We deliver a, a full meal, a, a meal that's nutritious. We bring a milk, a milk is usually a low, a low calorie milk, a 2%, 1% milk. They get a snack, sometimes maybe um, 
a cookie or something, something sweet to go along with the meal pudding. They they get full. Uh, um, they get a vegetable or fruit. Sometimes they get bread, and uh, I I just I feel good. It makes me feel good to be able to get out and and render this service where you know they are able to stay at home and you know as I get old I realize the importance of wanting to stay at home and, you know you want to be in your own home a lot of times that that that's uh, a difference between a senior living longer uh, and uh, I, 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 I even know uh, if I didn't have the time to do this I would want to help the program to continue. I just feel I'm just that passionate about Meals on Wheels. If you would like to become a Meals on Wheels client, you must be a resident of Montgomery, live within the city limits, be homebound, and at least 60 years old. And now for a look into the world of visual arts. Trinity Sorensen gives us a peek. That concludes our last show of the school year. We hope that you've enjoyed all the stories that we've brought to you during the year. And if you've missed any of those stories, you can find them on YouTube at BTW Magnet Around the Dub. We hope you'll join us next year as we continue to pursue excellence in our reporting. I've enjoyed being your host. So stay safe over the summer. See you next year right here Around the Dub.